Welcome to Full Momentum and HEC RAS Podcast. I am your host, Ben Carey, and here joining me, as always, is the wonderful Chris Cadell. Chris, <laughs> welcome to episode 20 of uh, this Full Momentum series. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. It's been a very long time, if ever, that somebody referred to me as the wonderful, <laughs> uh, but I'll take it. Hey, that's cool. That's very kind of you. Um <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it's a good day for a podcast. It's nice and uh, cloudy out here right now. Uh, kind of depressing day. So it's always fun to hang out and uh, chat about fun things like Hecraz and, and whatever else comes to mind. So how have you been? I've been good. Yeah, just looking forward to this conversation. I know we got some a good good topic to talk about today and we have some really exciting uh, future episodes coming down the pipe with some interviews with some industry experts that I'm looking forward to having in the upcoming months so yeah uh, if you've enjoyed our our podcast up to this point uh, definitely stay tuned because we got some really exciting stuff coming in 2022 um, including uh, that we are actually going to be adding this series as a downloadable podcast uh, which is something that folks have been clamoring for <laughs> uh, <laughs> over over the last couple of years that Chris and I have been doing this uh, we're going to keep it as primarily a podcast because we feel like you know, presenting the content via screen sharing and being able to talk visually about pictures and HEC RAS, the software, uh, it really helps inform uh, the folks that are tuning in. But we also hear that there are a number of folks that just kind of like to listen to this on maybe their drive to work or when they're doing yard work um, and having, you know, a video platform open to, to do that isn't always the most convenient thing. So we are going to add it as a podcast. It'll be available on Spotify as well as iTunes to download. Uh, so yeah, for those of you guys who have been waiting for that, uh, your your request has been answered. <laughs> yeah, that's cool. Glad that you uh, you got that set up, Ben. That's going to be a great um, additional or alternative way for people to tune in to these. And hey, you know, if you do, if you are listening and uh, something piques your interest and you you want to see the video or the visual of it, you can always go back to the YouTube site and look at it that way and yeah this is i mean hey we're talking about heck raz here and we're showing stuff so there's going to be a lot of visuals but you know we can cover a lot of it too uh without the visuals too so uh just more options that's all absolutely yeah so um we got a really cool topic today ben we'll get to here in a little bit um I'm excited to talk about this because it's uh, well, frankly, it's not the easiest thing to model. Mm -hmm. um, and and that's really that's what gets me excited about HECRAS modeling is the challenge of it. Right. Um, anytime there's a challenge, some complexity that makes it it makes it like a puzzle, right? Solving a mm -hmm. puzzle. Um, so it gets kind of fun. So we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, ben and I and a couple of our colleagues had a really funny conversation yesterday uh over lunch and uh we were actually talking about podcasts and uh ben brought up the uh question hey if you if you were going to do your own podcast what would it be on of course besides you know, ras besides, besides he heck ras yeah <laughs> uh, we're all heck ras modelers at the table so uh that one's already taken by ben and ben and me so um so we went around and uh anyway long story short we kind of got on the topic of things that annoy us with air travel right and this guy <laughs> it got really heated I, I was uh not heated as much as just animated a lot a of <laughs> a lot of loud talking in the restaurant where we were i thought i thought there might have been a chance we'd get kicked out um not that we were being rude or anything just very animated loud discussions but um Ben, I wanted to ask you to kind of continue this conversation real briefly on our Heck Raz podcast, Full Momentum here is, you know, what, what's the number one thing, if you had to sum it down to one thing, number one thing that bugs you about air travel? Mm. What just annoys you? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, and I'll admit that you know, my answer here is probably going to come from a unique place because my dad's a pilot. So I grew up uh, in, in the airport a lot and been around a lot of different top types of flights. He's a he's a pilot for Alaska Airlines. Uh, shout out to Alaska. I'm still waiting to 
see him in the cockpit. One of these days, yeah. I'm going to look in there and go, hey, there's Ben's dad. Yeah, well, it'll, <laughs> happen. it'll happen one day if you just keep trying. Uh, yeah. But but anyway, so my biggest grievance, grievance about air travel is something called gate lice. And for those of you who are hardcore airport travelers or work in the airline industry, you'll know what I'm referring to. But Say gate again, lice. what? Gate, gate lice. Gate, gate lice? Gate lice. So okay. gate like the bug, like yeah. in your hair. That's what, it, that's what it's called. So gate lice. Okay. So I'm intrigued. The concept of gate lice was really, and I'm going to throw them under the bus here for a second. Please don't, <laughs> please don't sue us, Southwest Airlines. But <laughs> I, it was really uh, started by Southwest Airlines because uh, when Southwest implemented their boarding procedure of allowing you know folks basically to line up, um, and then when you line up in your spot, then you you know, move on through the the on ramp and, and get it, get into your seat. So it's kind of a first come first serve basis. And until that point, people would just kind of wait to board the airplane when it was their turn. And there wasn't you know this big issue of of a mass of people waiting right outside the gate to get on the airplane and blocking people trying to get through. And it's just just a pain in the butt. So um, that's that whole concept of just a big mass of people waiting right at the gate when everybody in the group knows that they have their assigned seat you know they're going to get to it and it's not like they're going to the plane's going to leave without you but everyone feels the need to stand at the gate and block <laughs> travel through everything yeah. so uh air, pilots that's and, called and, gate lice huh pilots and flight attendants and gate and uh gate attendants will will call that gate lice uh we'll say the gate, well, gate lice is really heavy today if that's happening and that's partially oh, because of southwest funny. airlines that's funny. You know, I, I've noticed that. That's one of the things that bugs me, too. In, in an airport, you'll have this big open concourse area and you get to a gate and the people waiting to board just kind of push their way back into this what used to be a very open, spacious concourse to the point where there's about, you know, one quarter of the space left. Everybody who's walking past that gate has to kind of funnel their way through there. And yeah, that's annoying. Uh, you know, that's a good one, Ben. I, I have so many <laughs> annoyances. <laughs> ben and I, uh, Ben, well, even before Ben started working here or even, you know, graduated college, you're probably a, a veteran already having a, a dad in the industry as a pilot. You, you've probably flown more than most people. Uh, but we both do a lot of flying for um, for work as well. So there's, there's lots of opportunities to uh, find little nuisances. I have so many, I couldn't even pick one, but mine would, I think, can be summed up into awareness or lack of, you know, people at the airport just have a complete lack of awareness. So awareness of, um, you know, their intrusion on your space or lack of awareness of how loud they're being or how rude they're being or the fact that they're standing in the middle of the concourse when everyone has to walk around them. Yeah. So there's a lot of lack of awareness, both in the airport and on the airplane. Um, you know, the, we were, we were, we were getting into this, the whole seat thing yesterday and, you know, uh, people banging on seats and and tray tables and stuff and just not really aware that that affects other people around you. So um, that's my biggest thing. But all in all, it's not that big of a deal. Um, most most of my flights are pretty easy going. Yeah, I'd like to hear from our listeners. What are your biggest air travel grievances? Because we're we're making a list here because mm -hmm. uh, I think it needs to be documented. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, I think you can. I think it's fair to say after our conversation yesterday and just having traveled enough, you can tell a lot about a person by traveling, you know, via airplane with them. Just in terms of how how a person conducts themselves, how they do under pressure, under some stress, how they interact yes. with other people, how they interact with service industry people. Uh, you yeah, can, you can tell a lot about folks. <laughs> yeah. Bottom line: be nice out there, everyone. Be nice. Yep. Yeah, especially as especially. We're <laughs> yeah, especially as we're getting back into to air travel being become becoming more and more of a, a norm and we've been cooped up in our homes working on our own for a long time. Uh, remember that when you're traveling, uh, be, be nice. That's really the bottom line. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I've got a flight next week, Ben, and uh, so I'll get to, uh, you know, hopefully have a good one and uh, 
minimize the nuisances that happen. But um, are you going? And, are you flying down to do some training? Yeah. Yes, I will be doing some training nice. in uh, Houston, Texas next week. So very cool. Uh, well, yeah. that's an opportunity. That obviously, not everybody can sign up to to get in person training with Chris Cadell in Houston, Texas. But uh, everybody who's listening to this right now does have the opportunity to get. Uh, HEC 1D, 2D RAS training uh, from Chris and I. Uh, unfortunately, our spring class, which starts which starts here in just a few weeks, is just about full. I think there's only one or two spots left. Um, so by the time you're listening to this, it very well may be full. Uh, but the good news is, is we had so much demand and we filled up so much earlier than we ever have for any class, which is a great thing. Uh, we've already scheduled our next class. So, Chris, why don't you tell the people if you're interested, if you missed the opportunity to sign up for the spring class, when's your next chance to take an online 1D, 2D RAS training with with your yours truly? <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, if you weren't able to get into this one that's coming up here real soon, uh, which I think starts February, what, uh, end, end of this month. So, <laughs> yeah, I, I don't remember the exact date. But... Um, if you couldn't get into that one, there will be another one starting June 15th going through July 20th. So it's going to be the same online format we've had in the past uh, six weeks. Uh, we'll meet for four hours once a week. And uh, so that will go June 15th to July 20th. It's not too early to sign up for that one. If you're interested and you want to get on the mailing list or get uh, registered for it, go to our website kleinschmidtgroup.com and look under the knowledge hub and you'll see a link for professional development classes and there you'll be able to sign up or at least get on the early advance notice list if we haven't started signups yet for that um and that way you'll be sure to get into that one yep. so hope to see you guys there it's it's ben and i have a good time with it um and we may even open the the discussion to airplane grievances during the class to keep that <laughs> discussion going um, or other fun topics, but it's mostly about heck raz. So, yeah. yeah. And if those, if there's some folks that are listening that are bummed out or frustrated that um, we close the registration, we do keep a cap on our classes, um, not because we have to, but simply because we want to provide quality education for everybody that's participating. I know everybody that's listening to this podcast has probably been on those webinars where there's thousands of people tuning in and you never get your questions answered. Um, it feels like, you know, you're not really able to get a personalized experience. Um, and Chris and I try to cap our classes so that we can still provide that to everybody who wants to register. That's the reason why we cut off the size. Uh, for no other reason. So uh, just another little plug there that we try to do the best by everybody who who takes our class. So. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Awesome. Well, before we get into today's technical topic, uh, I want to take a moment to thank our sponsor. Uh, we're thankful for our sponsor, Kleinschmidt, Kleinschmidt Associates, who is known throughout the industry as a firm that provides practical solutions to complex problems affecting energy, water, and the environment. You can learn more at kleinschmidtgroup.com. I will also plug that we are in a, I'm not going to say a frenzy, but a we're at a significant hiring pace right now, Chris. The number of hiring positions that Kleinschmann has is numerous right now in a bunch of different areas, including some restoration and water resources type positions. So if you've ever had any interest with working, uh, working at a really, really awesome water resource uh, environmental focused firm, go check out our website. We have all our job postings there and uh, yeah, it's a great time to come on to Kleinschmidt. Um, so just wanted to give a little plug there too. Yeah, and um, yeah, just want to also mention with those, um, while we'd love to be able to have the opportunity to hire anybody around the world, uh, we are limited to hiring those who are currently qualified to work in the U.S. So just want to put that out there in case you're wondering about that. Uh, so you already have to have that um you know that um, the ability to to work in the U.S. whether it's green card or the visa or whatever it is. Yeah, I don't know the details on that, but uh, anyway. So yeah, if um, that interests you, go to our website. Love awesome. to talk to you. Great, cool. 
So what's right, let's get into the technical topic for today, Chris. Uh, last week, we had a chance to talk about uh, a devastating landslide that caused really a, a tsunami within a reservoir that overtopped a dam and kind of how that was a really unique dam breach type of scenario that we don't normally see within HEC RAS. Um, today, we're going to talk about another unique topic uh, in the in the RAS world. And that's a topic I want to give a quick shout out to one of our listeners who commented on our video, uh, Moana BK. I don't know if that's a he or a she, but they commented that they would like to see us talk about urban flood modeling. And uh, I saw that comment kind of sparked an interest and I was doing some research. And unfortunately, our, our discussion takes us back to Brazil today um, that has been dealing. We talked about this last week with a, a massive amount of, of rain and um, that rain led to the landslide that we talked about last week. It's also led to just massive flooding across the country. Um, specifically in the state of Sao Paulo, um, in which there have been 24 people confirmed to have lost their lives from flooding, thousands of people that have been displaced. And, you know, photos that I'm sure many of you guys have seen, uh, maybe not in Brazil, but in other places around the world that are experiencing flooding. And that's this kind of combination of heavy rainfall combined with river flooding, combined with maybe a back backing up or a complete failure of a stormwater system. And you get you know this flooding that occurs within these urban areas and sometimes we want to be able to represent or model these uh, using HEC RAS. So we thought this would be a great topic for today uh, to talk about the challenges and approaches of doing urban flood modeling using RAS 2D. Um, Chris, I don't know if this is ever a discussion yeah. that you've had before with other folks. I know it's something that we've done some work on. Um, do you have any kind of starting thoughts? Yeah, I mean, first of all, we don't mean to be picking on Brazil, but you guys have been getting just blasted with rain, just enormous amounts. And whenever that happens, you know, um, some disasters are bound to occur and it just so happens to be going on in Brazil now. So these are where we're getting the, the most recent examples. But yeah, as far as modeling um, these kinds of things, it's it can be very tricky. And there's lots of ways to do it. Depends on what you're trying to get out of your model. So that's what we really want to talk about today is, is different ways to set it up and why you might go one route versus the other. Yeah, good. I'm going to use a background of a project that we did um, in the last couple of years down in Texas. It was an urban flood modeling situation. And I'm going to use this as kind of a reference to our discussion today. We can talk about different aspects of it and then we'll actually show some examples of how we implemented and used RAS 2D uh, to, to model this particular situation. So this is in uh, Texas, uh, in the Houston area of Texas. We have the Brazos River here, um, and then we have an urban area just to the north of that. And the situation that we were modeling was a uh, was at first replicating Hurricane Harvey and the flooding that occurred from that. And it was a combination of heavy, heavy urban rainfall on top of a really, really high river level in the Brazos River that led to some of the stormwater system uh, no longer functioning correctly, uh, which kind of snowballed into additional urban flooding, so on and so forth. So a kind of tough situation. I know everybody in Texas is very familiar with this situation, and it's something that we're, we see more and more commonly throughout the United States, specifically in the, in the southeast. So it's an it's a type of modeling scenario that HEC RAS modelers should have at least an idea of kind of how to handle. Uh, but there are certain challenges with doing this in HEC RAS. And in, in certain situations, um, you, HEC RAS may not be the right modeling software to use. Uh, obviously, HEC RAS isn't a stormwater focused uh, software. And so if you're modeling a situation in which the stormwater system of your area is going to be um, really important to replicating the results that that you maybe are calibrating to or you want to represent. Um, RAS might not be the right right choice for that software. Um, the, some examples of software that you could use um, in, in that type of situation would be something like XP Swim, which I have some experience using. Uh, it's a great software for that kind of surface slash stormwater modeling. Um, HydroCAD can also do some pretty good um, representation of stormwater systems. But for many folks um, in our industry, you may not have a license or not have the money to purchase a license to use those programs um, that are a little bit more stormwater focused. And maybe you're trying to just get a, a, a kind of a higher level understanding of what 
uh, urban flooding could look like in your particular area. And in that case, RASD is really, really applicable. Um, Chris, would you say that it's it's appropriate to, to ever do 1D modeling in urban areas, or is it safe to say that you should almost always be using 2D modeling in that case? It's a really good question, Ben. It's really hard to model it in 1D. Well, before RAS had 2D in it, we would, you know, occasionally have some urban areas in our modeling domain, and you would do your best with cross sections. But you'd have to know the limitations, right? With a 1D cross section, you get one water surface over the entire cross section. Your cross sections have to be drawn in perpendicular to the flow paths. You also get one velocity computed per cross section. That's not really going to give you a lot of detail if you've got a cross section spanning over in urban area. Um, but Maybe if this is a, let's see, uh, say a, a very large dam break model and you just happen to have a little urban area somewhere downstream of it, then maybe you don't need that kind of detail. Um, but if you do need the detail, if the urban area is the focus of your study, like this particular example that's been showing, then cross sections just aren't going to work. Um, it's just going to be, it's not going to give you the detail you need. Um, if you tried to, kind of discretize this thing into multiple, multiple small reaches <laughs> um, <laughs> interconnected to maybe capture conveyance areas down roadways or in between houses. It's just an impossible task. There's there's just no way you could do that feasibly and expect good results. So that's the benefit of 2D modeling is yeah. we can do that. But then you run into your own uh, um, set of problems or challenges even with 2D modeling um namely how do we represent the terrain right ben mm -hmm. yeah that's the what i was going to go into next chris yeah if we if we kind of come to the same consensus that in urban flood modeling situations we need to be using 2d modeling to adequately get the, the type of results that we're going to want um then the next question becomes okay well how do we represent all of the unique features in the terrain specifically if we're talking about an urban setting how do we represent buildings in a terrain mm -hmm. oftentimes you know, we'll have good LIDAR data sets, but most of the time, or some of the times I should say, I shouldn't say most of the time, some of the time the building footprint or the, the, the size of the building isn't actually represented in that terrain. It's been removed via kind of post-processing of that LIDAR. Uh, so there's a couple different ways to represent buildings if you're gonna be doing 2D RAS modeling of an urban area. The first is to include the building shape and size in the terrain itself. And that might be a matter of communicating with the company that's that's conducting your LIDAR survey or that conducted the LIDAR survey to see if you can get the raw LIDAR that contains the first returns of the building's roof and whatnot so that you can include that in your terrain. The second way is to uh, use a terrain that doesn't include those buildings uh, in the terrain itself, but instead add a Manning's roughness layer to your model that uses an elevated Manning's roughness uh, where that building footprint is. So it makes flow that's moving through that building a little bit less efficient. Um, it does a decent job of representing how that building would affect flow and flow patterns in the area, um, but you're not necessarily containing the, the building itself. So Chris, I'll turn it back to you. What's kind of mm -hmm. the pros and cons? What do you kind of lean towards when you're trying to represent buildings in an urban flood modeling situation? Yeah, so your first option including the buildings in the terrain sounds very appealing because now you actually see those buildings and those buildings obviously are going to have an impact on flow patterns right and and the resulting velocities and even depths around those buildings so it's going to give you something a lot more accurate now the downside to including all those buildings if you want to achieve that level of accuracy you're going to have to make your cells extremely small mm. right yeah. so that they can capture the flow in in between buildings or down these uh residential roads and in this case if you just look at the view that you have right here and imagine the size cells you're going to need to get an ac adequate representation of velocity in between the buildings yeah. and then try and picture how many cells that's going to be <laughs> in your overall model yeah. i mean we could easily be talking millions and millions of cells in yeah. here 
And not only millions of cells, but the cells, because they're so small, now we have to have a very small time step to go with it, right? So that our current number is not too high. Mm -hmm. And so on top of having so many cells, now you've got really small computation intervals. This model, you may find, is going to take you days to run or longer. Yep. The, other limitation, and, the other limitation too, Chris, is if you include the buildings and the terrain, is you're going to... Uh, be a little bit conservative in terms of the amount of available storage that's in your 2D area because yeah. you're assuming at that point that your buildings are solid, there's no water that can get inside of them. When in yeah, reality, we know that when these floods occur, mm -hmm. water does get into those and gets stored within those buildings. And so you could be over predicting water surface elevations if you have a lot of really, really densely placed buildings. Yeah. And so this gets to option number two, which you mentioned, which is to strip the raw lidar down to bare earth which is a common thing that we do for our hydraulic models uh, that's in fact usually what we do and you can see that's actually been done here even though you can see a little bit of elevation where the buildings are that's just because of the the pad the footprint or the um, foundation that it's on is, is a little bit elevated above the streets the building itself isn't on here and, um, and instead of having those buildings part of the terrain, we simulate the effect of those buildings with a higher end value. Now with that, you can get away with larger cells, right? But you're not gonna get the same kind of detail and precision around the individual buildings that you would get if you included those discreetly in the terrain. And so this would be a better option if you're trying to get an overall feel for flow patterns, generally what, you know, what's the flood risk in different parts of the residential area? How does the residential area as a whole affect the flood wave uh, moving down a river system? Things like that. And uh, so you're going to be able to, to put together a much more efficient model. It's going to likely be a lot stabler and easier to troubleshoot as well. Um, but you're not going to get the same level of detail. But I think for most applications, you don't necessarily need that level of detail. I think um, the only time you might is if you're doing a maybe a structural analysis on a building and you want to see what the loading would be on it from a flood. But if you're just looking for flood levels and a general understanding of velocities, uh, using end values instead of elevating the terrain might be the better approach. Now, the next question is, well, what do we use for our end value, right, Ben? I mean, what? Um, how do we select an end value for a urban area like this? Yeah, that's a good question. So Chris, as Chris was talking about that, I shared up on my screen what we did for this particular project. So like Chris said, we had a terrain that had removed the buildings themselves from, from the terrain. So we just had the building footprints and so we needed to be able to represent those buildings with elevated Manning's layer um, and elevated Manning's value. And so we actually had a, a Manning's layer constructed um, using a GIS guru that we know, went through and created us a Manning's layer with these elevated Manning's values for, for the buildings themselves. Now that can be a lot of work when you're talking about a, a model this size. So be aware of that as well. Um, sometimes because of all of that additional work, if you're using a program like RAS and you're trying to get maybe just a little bit of a higher level understanding of how the flooding is going to function, you might do some something like a composite panning zen for densely populated areas as opposed to less densely populated areas. And you're not going to necessarily discretize each individual home because that can be a ton of work. But yeah. in this case, we wanted near field results. Um, that were somewhat accurate because of the importance of this model. So we actually did generate that Manning's layer um, for each individual house as, as best we could. And it looks like we used values of 0 0.6 for a Manning's end value. I think that's a fairly common anywhere, you know, above really 0.5 is something I see fairly often for buildings. Once you get that high, really, you're not going to have very much flow at all inside of your structure. So it's not going to make a huge difference whether you use something that's 0.6 or something that's all the way up to maybe 10. You're not going to really get a huge difference in overall results. At least that's my experience. Is that something similar to what you would say, Chris? Yeah, and and keep in mind too, the way RAS handles the or applies the end value, it applies it to a cell face, right? Mm -hmm. And the end value it actually selects is the end value that happens to reside at the center point of a given face. 
And whatever that M value is, is applied to the entire face, at least in the current version of RAS. There's talk where uh, in the future, it might uh, allow us to have a variation of the N value over a cell face, but currently you get one N value per cell face and that N value is selected based on where the center point of that face is. And so with this example, you can imagine there are some faces where maybe it's getting um, an N value that represents a building when it should represent the street or vice versa, just because yeah. of the position of the face relative to the buildings. Mm -hmm. And there are, there, are, there are ways that you can try and improve that using break lines or you know isolated areas of smaller cells where needed. Um, but that would be a lot of work for this. So we kind of like in this particular example, we we recognize that there's going to be some of that error built into it and that, you know, overall it's going to kind of wash out um, at the end. Um, but that's just a thing to be aware of. And, you know, you could use smaller cells, but we didn't want to get too much smaller than this because our model is already taking a long time to run. Yeah. Um, the other thing too is you need to be aware of when you're building out a Manning's layer for an urban flood model like this, especially one that in this case, most of these urban areas where we have our homes aren't gonna be flooded from overland flow coming from a river. Uh, it's gonna be flooded based on really, really high rainfall amount that's gonna move via sheet flow or some of these other type of, uh, of flows where your Manning's values that you use that you're used to using in a riverine setting are actually going to be way, way too low. Um, mm. A lot of these areas, the manning's values are actually going to be quite a bit higher than what we're using. But because you build all of that uncertainty into this, you know, you could drive yourself crazy trying to make your model perfect to incorporate all of that detail and all that near field accuracy. But that wasn't the goal for this particular model. Um, so we, like Chris said, we understood that a lot of this was going to wash itself out. And so we used cell sizes that we thought were appropriate to try to capture some of that building detail in terms of how that would um, reduce the 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 flow conveyance over some of these urban areas but we didn't go crazy with it because we we had a project that we needed to finish so mm -hmm. um, just something else to consider when you're developing manning's roughness values for urban areas yeah um, and, and when it is really dense like this too um, it's perfectly valid, I think, for most applications to do the composite N value like you were talking about, Ben, where you mm -hmm. you group houses together or even neighborhoods together and give it a, a an N value for the entire neighborhood and just make sure that that N value is appropriate uh, for, in this case, I would call this high density urban. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't you call it that, Ben? I think? Yeah. There are yeah. there are some areas that you know have more like industrial, like you can see here. Mm -hmm. We have, um, you know, factories and more concrete. Yeah. So this might have a little bit lower of a roughness, and then we get into some low um, density residential areas, such as in here. So those are yeah. going to have their own land use as well. But a lot of these, um, you know, de large development are, are going to have very very similar roughness values. And if you use a composite. You're kind of acknowledging that, hey, I can't represent all the detail that we're capturing here, and so I'm going to acknowledge that by just using a composite roughness. And if if your goal is just to get a big picture overall understanding of how the area is going to flood in a in a really serious flooding type of event, that can be a perfectly reasonable approach. Yeah, totally. So the the next challenge once we get out of you know, deciding whether we're going to include the buildings, how we're going to use Mannings, what type of Mannings values we're going to use. Another challenge, this is something Chris already touched on briefly, is, is mesh size. Um, and this really just comes down to the type, what the goal of your model is for modeling an urban flooding situation. If the goal of your model is to understand what the shear stresses are going to be in between homes as the floodwater is moving through them, you're going to have a certain cell size that you're going to need to use for that type of analysis. If your goal for the model is to understand at a you know 2000 foot level, what are my inundation boundaries? What areas are generally at higher risk for flooding than other areas? Um, where do I need to make sure that emergency responders will, will access first? What type of depths are they going to be experiencing if they're going on, on, on rescue missions? Um, then you can use a different type of cell size. So, Chris, do you want to kind of talk about uh, what those might be in an urban flood setting? Well, so the first thing I think about when I'm, I'm uh, considering cell size is 
one, what level of precision and detail do I want in my output? And if I do want to see uh, a good estimate of velocity, say, down the roadways, yeah. then you would want to have a minimum three, preferably five cells or more across that conveyance zone. So in this case, across the roadway. Yeah. And uh, as you can see, that that major road that you have going kind of from uh, top left to, to the bottom, uh, I forget the name of that road, but um doesn't matter. But that's got a pretty good definition of cells going across it, right? You can see we've got between five and seven maybe going across there. So I think you would get a pretty good definition there. Some of the smaller roads in the in the neighborhood proper, mm -hmm. uh, cells are not big enough to capture the velocity through there. But that wasn't part of what we were concerned about very much because the water, frankly, the water, once it got into that area, was just more or less ponding, wasn't really yep. moving around. It was moving appreciably down the roadway, if I recall, Ben. And so that was one of the reasons we wanted to have those cells uh, it, a little it, bit smaller there. Exactly, Chris. I'm glad you brought that up. And this this goes back to one of our key takeaways that we always emphasize, and me and Chris are always on people about, including ourselves, because sometimes we fall short of this. And that is to <laughs> start simple, add detail where needed. This yeah. is a great example of applying that to a modeling project in the real world. And that is if you go through developing your 2D mesh for an area that's this size and this complex, and you're trying to capture all of the near field flow velocities in every roadway between every house, you're gonna drive yourself nuts. You're gonna end up with a model that takes days, if not weeks to run. Um, you, it's just, it's not going to be a good thing for your mental health as a hydraulic model. And we're all, we're all about keeping our hydraulic modeling mental health in a good place. And so, well, we don't we, want all of our hydraulic modelers quitting either. So exactly. yeah, we want to, we want everyone to stay interested in this. So you yeah. don't want to scare them away. Yeah, exactly. And so in this case, what we did is what we always recommend folks to do is we started with larger cells, even larger cells than what we have here. And what we did is we ran our Hurricane Harvey event and we looked at, hey, where are our highest velocities? Where is want water wanting to move generally based on the gradient of our terrain? Are there areas that are ponding versus are there areas that are kind of primary conveyance ways? And by doing that, we had a model that ran very fast. It ran very quickly. We didn't have a lot of detail in that first model run. But then we were able to go back through and add refinement regions to those areas yeah. so we could pick up the detail on how water is is moving most efficiently. And then you end up with a model that's kind of a combined discrete and um, not as discrete uh, 2D mesh. And it, it's a it's the best of both worlds. You you have a lot of efficiency in the areas where you're just having ponding and you kind of just want a big picture idea of how the flood flooding is affecting. And then in the areas where you have water that's moving primarily uh, and you want that, that accurate information about attenuation and, and time that it takes to get from one place to another and velocities in those areas, you can capture that with those refinement regions. Yeah, look at that other um, zone or conveyance area where we got really small cells is along the, uh, the creek or the bayou, they call yeah. it, through there. And you can see all the detail we're getting. That's where we're getting most of our velocity or movement of water through this. So it was very important that we get a good velocity distribution across there. The one thing about velocity distribution, if you were to, let's say, reduce this to one cell going all the way across that conveyance zone, then you're not doing any better than a cross section. In fact, you're doing even worse than a cross section because a cross section at least is subdivided into the left over bank, right over bank and main channel. So you get these three subdivisions with um, different um, velocities but if you have one cell you get one velocity and so you're not going to have that velocity distribution and as a result your water surface elevation is uh, going to be smoothed out as well and not very accurate there yeah i'm gonna switch up the order that we talk about stuff here chris in a second because i think this flows a little bit better the other thing that we wanted to mention about urban flood modeling is that oftentimes in these cases just like what we saw it happen in brazil this last month the, the type of boundary conditions that you're going to be using are going to be usually a combined, you know, river that maybe is overtopping its banks and flooding some of the areas near the river, along with precipitation that goes directly on the 2D mesh. And whenever you have that situation where you have rainfall applied to a 2D mesh, 
uh, one thing that you really need to be cognizant of is where you have break lines because when you when you're applying rainfall over an area if you don't assign break break lines in the correct place you can either have water moving where it shouldn't be based on some high ground features or you're actually going to be restricting water that looks maybe as though it is ponding but that's simply because you haven't captured where the the different outlets for that water are so one other thing to consider when you're doing rain on grid modeling in an urban setting you're going to have to take some time and spend some some resource to add all those break lines in in the appropriate locations make sure you're capturing the high ground features the low ground features even more so than we normally do in a river environment where really you're going to be focused on if there's you know, levees or the banks of the river in a 2d urban flood modeling setting there's going to be a lot of different locations that you have to put break lines again i would recommend that you do that after you've run those initial model runs so yeah you can see yeah where sure. you're having issues yeah and don't don't go overboard with it yeah. don't don't go overkill on break lines. I've seen some models that um, I've reviewed or um, yeah, have come across my desk and literally hundreds and hundreds of break lines. And it's because they, they had some automation routine in GIS that was able to pick up all the roads, all of the high ground features, everything was turned into a break line and brought into RAS and it just, uh, it just makes it overly complicated. And I think a lot of people who have done enough 2D modeling in RAS realize that uh, when you have too many brake lines, they start conflicting with each other and it gets to just be a complete nightmare trying to get rid of all those little red dots everywhere, yeah. you know, that you get when you have cell violations. And uh, one of the most common ways to get those these days is uh, when you have conflicting brake lines or you have cells that are trying to get from a very high resolution area to a very low resolution area too quickly. And so you just want to keep an eye out for those and try to minimize that kind of thing in your geometry setup so you have less headache to deal with later on. Yep, absolutely. That's a good tip, Chris. Uh, I mentioned it just a few minutes ago and I want to come back to it. And that's the idea of rain on grid in an yeah. urban flood modeling scenario. And that, uh, even at the time that we did this model, was a real challenge, uh, particularly because if you're trying to model a rain on grid type situation over a larger area, inevitably you're going to have some differences in the amount of rainfall that you have for a particular event. Yeah. And previous to version 6.1, that was a real limiting factor because previous to 6.1, you had to apply a uh, rainfall hydrograph uniformly over a single 2D area. And so in this case, what we had to do was actually a little bit, um, I'll, I'll call it caveman-ish, uh, not, <laughs> not quite as detailed as we can, can work with now, but we actually split up this whole study area into multiple 2D areas that were split up based on rainfall data that we had for the Hurricane Harvey event. Um, and that mm -hmm. took a lot of work. There was a lot of work connecting those 2D areas. It was complicated. It created instability. It was real a real headache. Now I ended up working in the end, but it was it was difficult. Uh, I just want to add that now with the new 6.1 uh, features to Rain on Grid, you have the ability to vary that rainfall spatially over a single 2D area. Uh, there's a number of different ways you can do that if you want to learn more. Uh, I'll link one of the episodes where Chris and I talk about rain on grid modeling. There's also some really great information and videos out there uh, from HEC on kind of how to how to implement that in the different options. So we won't focus on that particular topic today, but I just wanted to mention, you know, this is a huge improvement that HEC has made, and it's really opened up the possibilities of using rain on grid modeling for urban flood modeling scenarios uh, using RAS 2D. So yeah, can you can you imagine how different this model would have been if we had uh, spatial variation and rainfall available to us? Uh, yeah, it would have been a completely different setup, right? I thought we were all about keeping our mental health good as hydraulic models. <laughs> Sorry to bring that up. <laughs> if, if I think too much about that, yeah. I won't be able to sleep tonight. So uh, <laughs> I'm just happy that we have this now and that this is no longer going to be a reality of how, uh -huh. we, how we model this in the future. Um, yeah, you know, uh, speaking of keeping your sanity, uh, we had a lot of stability issues we had to work through in this model. But... If I recall, correct me if I'm wrong, Ben, but most of them had to do 
with our SA2D area connections where we were connecting up one 2D area to another one, 100%. right? And some of these had culverts, some didn't, some were just high ground areas that got overflowed. But all of those connections in there, those are all points for extra probability of having instability issues to deal with. So the less breakup you have to do, the 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 less 2D areas you, you have to build that you connect together, the better chance you're going to have a model that's not going to give you as much trouble. And um, most of those instabilities were due to submergence, if I recall, right? Yeah, just and just the complexity of trying to, again, you know, we were stretching the limitations of RAS for this project. You know, we yeah. were using SA2D area connections where our SA2D area connection was almost two miles long. And that's just, that's really difficult computationally for RAS to handle water moving over the top of that. So um, you're right, Chris, that was the biggest limitation. Uh, it's not just that the model would have been a much easier to set up and run if we had had the spatial rainfall. Uh, it would have also been so much less of a headache from a stability standpoint because you wouldn't have had mm. this condition, So Yeah, yeah. Good. Uh, the other thing I wanted to touch on with this model and something that's going to come up, I'm sure, for folks that are, are watching this video and have done urban flood modeling in the past is how is there any way to incorporate, you know, significant portions of the stormwater system into HEC RAS? Uh, because the reality is, is if we can't do stormwater modeling in HEC RAS, we know we can't do that as of right now. Um, but maybe we don't have either the resources or the license capability to use a program like XP Swim, in which case you can do that. Is there something in between? And the answer is yes. And the answer, I'll show you guys what we did on this particular project. But what we decided to do initially, we said, you know, we want to look at this from a conservative standpoint. So we're going to assume that the stormwater system during an event as serious as Hur Hurricane Harvey is incapacitated. It's not functional, and so we're not going to count on it to function. But after we ran some initial model runs, we realized that that's probably not realistic, especially on the receding end of a flood. You know, once you have that, that peak of the flooding when the rainfall is the highest, you know, the stormwater system is probably going to get overwhelmed. But as that rainfall recedes, the stormwater is going to kick back on and start moving water around. And we weren't able to capture that kind of back end of the, of the flood uh, that we were looking at. And we really wanted to be able to capture that. And so what we did is we decided that we're going to incorporate key stormwater facilities, our major stormwater trunk lines that are moving the areas of the largest drainage and that are key in terms of connecting different areas that might be hydraulically isolated if we didn't, if we didn't include those. And so, Chris, I'll let you talk about kind of how we did that. But more or less what we did is we, we identified areas that needed these key trunk lines added. We had the stormwater data. Um, from the client that we were working with, and we we implemented those. So you want to talk about that, Chris? Yeah. So first of all, I just want to reiterate what Ben said, but RAS is not a stormwater model. It's not built for that. That being said, there are elements in RAS that you can use to help simulate some of these features if you want to include them, if they're important enough. Now, if the stormwater aspect of this is the primary driver of what you're doing here, why you're modeling this, I would suggest you go to one of those other models that Ben mentioned earlier, XP Swim or um, Tuflow or whatever uh, other models out there that can do it. But if you know, you're looking at overland flooding, your stormwater maybe is a component, but not the major component, but you want to try to incorporate or account for some of these stormwater features, then yeah, you can make use of some of the available elements in HECRAS like culverts or gates or even rules to some extent you can use the rules um, scripting to try and kind of custom make a rating curve to simulate a uh, a stormwater feature but uh, you don't have gutters in ras you don't have drop inlets um, manholes those kinds of things that you find in stormwater systems that that can be very important so you got to make do with what you have and that's what we did in this model is we we used the available elements and we did the best that we could another thing that i'll bring up too and i did did this not in this particular model but in um another model that i was working on several years ago where there's a river that actually was capped and 
conveyed underneath an urban area. So they basically built on top of this river. They tunneled the whole thing. And uh, we wanted to include that in the model. And so I actually had a river reach, 1D river reach with cross sections going underneath a 2D area. And I was very kind of um, suspicious whether or not this would actually work. And it did work. Uh, I just modeled the cross sections as lids, put it, it basically spatially in the same location as the 2D area, technically representing it as being underneath the 2D area. And, and it worked. That was a little bit tricky, but we were able to get it to work. So you can you can kind of fit RAS uh, into a stormwater system. Just I wouldn't try to do it if it was the focus of your study. Yeah. Yeah. So like Chris said, in our study, we we we, we wanted to incorporate some uh, stormwater facilities, but we we realized that we weren't going to be able to do a perfect job of it. So what we did is we identified those key major trunk lines where we needed to represent the drainage that would be occurring. And we added those trunk lines as gates uh, in SA2D area connection. So we added an SA2D area connection, and then on that SA2D area connection, we added a gate. And that gate uh, elevation, the inlet elevation of that gate, was the elevation of the intake or where maybe the manhole would be um, that would be collecting some of that drainage and then we were able to draw the the path of that trunk line again we get we got these plans from the stormwater network and we're able to represent where that drainage ends up in terms of where it's discharging to in our situation some of those were discharging to some of the ponds some of them were discharging to the bayous or the creeks some of them were discharging directly out to the Brazos River floodplain. And so by, by adding in those trunk lines, we were able to do a much better job of representing what was seen on the ground during Hurricane Harvey. Um, before I move on to that whole idea of, of, of calibration, Chris, do you have anything else you want to add to, to this conversation? Yeah, one thing to be careful of and be aware of, I should say, is these trunk lines that you can see here that we're representing with gates or culverts um, just be aware that that there's no travel time associated with those features. Mm -hmm. So if you have a really long stormwater pipe or system and you're trying to model it, RAS is not going to know that it takes however long it takes for the water to move through it. It just assumes, it calculates what's going through it, um, and it just places that water the next time step at the downstream cell. So there's no travel time. So be aware of that. Uh, just understand that's a limitation. Yeah. Yeah. And in this case, again, we had our shrunk lines representing our major stormwater facilities. We had culverts that were, you know, part of the, the drainage network that we included. We also included outlet pumps, uh, which were a real challenge because those are big pumps moving a lot of water. Uh, and we included those at the time. You could only connect pumps to SA2 uh, to um, storage areas. So we actually had to have another connection platform, not just 2D to 2D, but we had to create little storage areas that we could add pumps to those. That's no longer an issue either with the new 6.1. You can add those directly to 2D cells, which would have been a huge help. Um, mm -hmm. But that was another component that we added that that worked. It was it was some work and it was a challenge, but we made it work. Um, we used some of the, the programming knowledge that Chris has when it comes to, to writing rules for those pumps and the outlet facilities that we had there. But in the end, um, you know, we had a model that, that functioned and we were really confident in how it was functioning. And that's because we had data to calibrate to, which is the last thing that I wanna to touch on today, Chris, and that is the importance of calibrating a 2D urban flood model. Uh, you know, obviously calibration in any hydraulic modeling scenario is gonna be very critical to building confidence that we're representing that particular area correctly uh, under, the, mm -hmm. under the flow event that we're trying to model. In urban flood modeling using 2D RAS, that's even more critical because of all the uncertainty that we've talked about today, whether it's the uncertainty of Manning's values, the uncertainty with how building footprints or the lack thereof are gonna impact hydraulics, the uncertainty of the cell sizes, the simplification of representing certain areas with larger cells, um, you know, trying to capture some stormwater facilities, but acknowledging that we're not able to capture them all. Uh, rain on grid and the limitations of rainfall data that you may have. All of this gets thrown into a blender 
And if you don't have calibration data to verify how your model's functioning, you're going to end up you know, with a model that you're probably not going to be very confident in using for predicting or designing uh, like we needed to do in this case. So um, Chris, I don't know if you recall, do you remember what we used for calibration data for this particular model? Yeah, we had several high water marks established throughout the area, um, and some of them were as simple as surveying stains on fences. Remember that, Ben, when we did the uh, site visit there walking around, you could still see the staining on fences and other structures in this area from when the flood, Hurricane Harvey flood happened. And so that's a great way to get high water marks staining. Um, mm -hmm. Because how many years after Harvey was this that we went down there? Mm -hmm. Five, mm -hmm. six, seven um, years later. So, um, yeah, a lot of the other evidence will have been long gone, but the staining was still there. Yeah, so high water marks was one that we had that was really, really helpful. And we had those high water marks scattered. They were more concentrated towards the lower end of the basin, which made sense because that's where most of the flooding had occurred. But yeah. we did have some other high water marks from staining and other things like that. So that's one key component that you're going to really not need to get necessarily, but really want to get to help verify how is my model doing and predicting the water service elevations that pr is produced from this event. The other uh, type of calibration data that we had that was really helpful is we had aerial imagery um, that was collected mm -hmm. after Hurricane Harvey in the days after that that showed the inundation, flooding inundation that had occurred in this area. And we were able to take that aerial imagery data and we were able to assign it a time. So we knew the almost down to the hour, the time that those photos were taken. And we were able to generate inundation boundaries just by drawing it. Now there's some uncertainty there. You know, it's hard to tell sometimes, does this area have staining water or does it not? Um, but for the most part, we were able to ID, ID those areas that had staining water. And then we were able to compare those inundation boundaries to the inundation boundaries from the results from the Hurricane Harvey model. And we were really happy with how those turned out. Uh, that Those along with matching the high water marks as well as we did uh, really built our confidence in using this model to predict uh, similar type flooding situations moving forward. Yeah, do you remember how we uh, how we figured out the time of day that that aerial imagery was of the flooding? I uh, this yeah, this was a really clever thing that we came up with. So oh, yeah. on Google Earth, if you find some historic imagery, they'll tell you what day it was taken usually, mm -hmm. but they don't give you the hour or minute. And uh, with this flood event, a lot changed hour by hour. So we couldn't just, you know, you know, pick pick any hour in that day. We had to know the exact hour. And so fortunately, the aerial imagery was taken. It was during the flood, so you could see the flooding, but it also happened to be sunny at the same time. So the clouds had passed long enough for the sun to come out, and mm -hmm. it was casting shadows. And so we could measure shadows from buildings. And if we knew the height of the building and we know the latitude on the earth of where this is, we could actually estimate what time of day that was. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that got us to like, uh, I think it ended up being like 830 in the morning or nine o'clock in the morning or something like that. And so, um, yeah, that's a, a, a really kind of cool, clever way of figuring out time of day of your aerial imagery. Yeah, absolutely. And if you guys are curious, you can go to Google Earth and actually find imagery data of, uh, you know, Houston, the Houston area after Hurricane Harvey. It's pretty remarkable to see some of those images. Yeah. Uh, but like Chris said, combining the results of our model with those inundation boundaries that we were able to discretize from the aerial imagery, uh, you know, we were able to match up those inundation boundaries really well. And, and we we're really happy with how the model did. So yeah. you combine all that uncertainty and all the kind of question marks that come with urban flood modeling, and you're able to offset a lot of that with calibration data. So just want yeah. to emphasize the importance of that. Now, I will say, you know, even if we didn't have any calibration data, our model would have been useful um, for assessing kind of general flooding patterns within this area, but probably not for design purposes, which is what we ended up actually using this for, uh, designing some the size of some of the pump pump outlets uh, to, to drain the facilities. So 
um, yeah, it was a great project. We learned a lot. Like Chris said, it would have been a lot simpler to do with the new 6.1 software, uh, but we got through it and uh, we were better better for it. So, um, yeah. Anything else, Chris, to add to folks? I just want to, yeah, I just want to build on your calibration. I think that's so important for a model like this because there's so much uncertainty here, uh, not just in model setup, cell size, but also end values, how we're dealing with the terrain how many trunk lines we've included or stormwater elements we've included in there. A lot of uncertainty in the accuracy of the results. And so having that calibration data was invaluable because that essentially takes what would be just a simulation and makes it a model. I mean, that's the difference. A simulation is basically a model without calibration included. And so until you calibrate it, you don't really have a model. You don't have a tool that is representing real life conditions to any kind of certainty. So that's what we're trying to do. And I agree with you completely, Ben. If Even if we didn't have the calibration data, we still could have used this model to answer some of the questions. Notably, when you compare different alternative, um, uh, different alternatives one to the other, um, you can at least gauge like which one might do a better job than the other, but you're not going to be able to get the, you know, a good handle of the actual magnitudes or capacities of these different alternatives. So, but um, yeah, that was a fun one. That was a fun yeah. model. Stressful at times, a little bit, uh, I don't know, felt like some of my gray hair came, came from that model. <laughs> I still have some non-gray hair left to uh, to turn gray on some uh, future projects, but um, <laughs> good, good. Well, bottom line, I think it's it's safe to say, Chris. You know, we both recognize RAS is not a stormwater model, but it yeah. can be really useful if you know how to use it to model urban flooding situations. Um, you just got to understand the uncertainties that come with it, limitations. And then if you can acquire some of the calibration data to help offset some of that. Now you kind of have a model that's a lot more useful for some of those uh, more detailed type of, of analysis. So uh, we hope mm -hmm. everybody found this video to be interesting and informative. Uh, I'm sure there'll be a lot more questions that come out of this video. Um, and maybe we'll do a follow up video addressing some of those because I think this is a really interesting topic that's relevant to a lot of folks uh, because the reality is, is RAS users don't do this very often, so it's not something that we're as comfortable with, but uh, but it's cool to try something new. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for sharing that, Ben. That was a really great example to talk about a little uh, or a lot of different aspects of urban flood modeling in RAS. And uh, tell us how it's working for you. If you've had any challenges, put them in the uh, comments. And don't forget to tell us about what bugs you about air travel, too, because uh, I really want to know <laughs> what other people are running into when they uh, fly from places, place to place. Yeah. So, yeah. And again, if you're interested in learning more from Chris and I about HEC RAS 1D, 2D modeling, we don't necessarily cover urban stormwater modeling, but we cover a lot of the components that we needed to know to build that model and make it work. Um, so if you're interested in learning more from us, sign up for our online class. Uh, likely the spring is going to be full by the time you go and do that, um, but we do have another class in June, so sign up for that right away. We'd love to have uh, people participate and they learn from us. So hey, real it. quick, Ben, before we close out, who are we rooting for for the uh, Super Bowl? Well, good question. Uh, I, you know, I don't really have a huge... <laughs> Somebody are you saying that full momentum is not officially endorsing either team? I think we can remain on the fence in this one. I'm <laughs> okay. still, Fair as enough. soon as as soon as my football team, which I'm a Colts fan, so as soon as the Colts lose, all my focus shifts to Gonzaga. So I kind of forgot yeah. about the Super Bowl. You know, mm -hmm. I don't want to. I don't want to talk about how the Colts season ended. I'm I'm just focused on March Madness. So. All right, let's go. <laughs> let's go, Zags. Uh, I can guarantee you, Oregon State will not be in the tournament this year like last year. Um, it's a very bad year for us, but uh, I can at least root for the Zags with you. Well, you know, we always welcome bandwagoners, uh, especially bandwagoners in the Northwest that appreciate watching watching some good basketball. So, uh, yep, hopefully, yep. we'll we'll talk to you guys again soon. Again, we got some exciting content coming up in the next couple of months, including some interviews with some industry experts, some of which you may be familiar with. Uh, so stay tuned on that. And uh, yeah, 
thank you guys again for listening. This has been Full Momentum in HEC RAS podcast. Talk to you later.